Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, I'm a person who enjoys history. I like history shows, I like reading about it. And sometimes I think about what has an event in history really, really had to do with me. Now, if you think about history, you may pick out events and say, okay, I can see the direct cause and effect to something in my life. For instance, 9-11 has made traveling an absolute hassle through an airport. And there's, of course, other security measures and big buildings and games and so forth, all because of 9-11. World War II, huge effect. It has created our geopolitical background. In some ways, you could argue it's not really over. Its effects are that profound. But as you start getting further back in history, you, know, you start going, well, that's interesting, but it really didn't shape my world. And, and maybe it did in some subtle way, but it gets harder and harder to see. But here's an event almost 2,000 years ago. A lot of people have dismissed it as meaning nothing. And yet... It is the most significant event in any one of our lives. It absolutely shapes our, our world. It shapes why we are here. And it absolutely is the only thing to be considered when we leave this world. So this whole Passion Week event, which, which Aaron read for us, think about what's driving it. Think about how it went from Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, to crucify him, crucify him in, in such a short period. Who's to blame? Now, it's easy to pick out the Jewish leaders and say they're to blame. They're the ones that had it out for Jesus for a long time. They have made this plot. They weren't going to give it up. They pushed and bent. Pontius Pilate's arm, they made it happen. Or you could pick on Pontius Pilate. You could say, you know, here's this man. It's his job, his job to make sure that there is justice in the land. And because he is such a political person, he just sort of ignores justice altogether and, and executes an innocent man. But if you have any sense at all about this event, you realize that both of those people or people groups are minor players. They are simply pawns in this whole story, moved by, by bigger powers than, than they were. And so you come to Satan. Is Satan driving this event? Now it comes down to what part of it you want to talk about and how much you think he actually knew. <clears throat> Satan has been trying to stop God's plan. Doesn't mean he knew what God's plan was. But I'm one that's going to give him a little bit of credit. He is a powerful being. By this time, I would think he surely understands what God is trying to do. Now he tries to stop it. But yet in the end, I can't even lay this event on Satan's lap. It is God who brought Jesus here. It is God who used the evil of certain people to make it happen. Jesus is meant to be crucified. Jesus is meant to be forsaken. And the thing driving it ultimately is God's love for you and for me. So if I can say that anybody has influence over this event 2,000 years ago, I can look in the mirror and I can say, it was me. And you can look in the mirror and say, it was me too. We made this event have to be. We made this event happen. Now, in saying that, I don't think we can lay claim to all of it. 
This story has got some real ugliness to it. When we first present it to our children, it's pretty cleaned up. But if you see a movie like The Passion of the Cross, now you're getting closer to it. Even that, I think, falls short of what it was like. There are emotions, there are actions, that are just plain ugly in this event. It is R-rated at best. Where does it all come from? The hatred being spewed by the Jewish leaders, for instance. Where is that coming from? It is not just coming from religious conviction. It is coming from the depth of the human soul, a resistance to God that we all have. And there it is absolutely raw and to the surface. And they speak it and they act on it. The corruption of justice, like we mentioned before, perverse. It is because in each of us is a sinful nature that would love to just have it our way. What's best for us? Pontius Pilate acted the way humans act. The cruelty. You know, Pontius Pilate gave those soldiers a job. Punish him. Few whips. That's it. And yet that's not what they do. Though we can't say for sure from the reading just how badly Jesus is whipped. When it finally says that he's poked with a spear and, and out comes from his body is water mixed with blood. You can tell that he died by trauma, not suffocation. That trauma happened largely because they whipped him to an inch of his death. Where did that cruelty come from? And then all the temptations for at least the first three hours. Come down from the cross if you are the Christ. Save yourself. Save yourself and us. Satan's driving all of that. He he now realizes that he needs Jesus to exercise his divine power and quit. That's what Satan needs. He doesn't want him anymore to go all the way to the end because he knows if he makes it to the end, if Jesus makes it to the end, Satan loses. So he brings out his full arsenal and tries so hard. God's judgment on sin. God's judgment on sin is clearly placed forward. The wages of sin is death. The sinner needs to physically die. The sinner needs to be forsaken. That's the wages of sin. To be mocked, to be beaten, to be whipped. All those things, they're not the wages of sin. The wrath of God is seen sufficiently in what happens on the cross. Especially when it gets to be noon. Noon. It's not so much crucifixion even. It's what happens at noon. Or at least what I believe happens at noon. Jesus is going to cry out by the end of this. A three hour period of darkness. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This three-hour period of darkness, filmmakers have struggled to portray. I have seen it where they've made it like an eclipse. But we know there was no solar eclipse. And how long does the eclipse last? What, 45 minutes maybe at most? That's not it. The worst I've seen is they made it into a rainstorm. When Luke reports the sun stopped shining, this is not a weather report to say it got overcast. Well, something more is happening there. Now, there might be a clue that comes actually as a prophecy in Joel 
and, and then later is, is spoke on the day of Pentecost, where it says that, that there is blood and billows of smoke. And like, where's the billows of smoke part? Maybe that is what blocks the sun. But it could very well be that what happens is exactly what it says. The sun, this giant ball of burning gas, stops shining. How? By the power of the one who made it. Because of the event that's happening. We don't understand how deep it is for, for the Father and the Son to be forsaken, right? For the Father to turn his back on part of the Trinity. That is a power, that is an event beyond our comprehension. And yet all along, Jesus knew this was coming. He understood this event as necessitating his being forsaken because he knew the law, he knew the plan better than anybody. And yet, how bad is it to be forsaken? So bad that after three hours, Jesus is so devastated, even though he knows it's limited, even though he knows what it's for, that he asks, why? Why have you forsaken me? And of course, the answer to the question, very personal again. He's forsaken you, Jesus, because of me. Because of me. Because the Father judges sin, and I've sinned. Because the Father doesn't want to give up on me either, nor you. That's why. And after three hours, it's finished. In a way, as devastating as it is, it seems like a deal. Because if we would go and face the punishment of the law, we would be forsaken forever. So Jesus gladly takes on his shoulders three horrible hours plus the time that came before it, which probably seemed like nothing. In comparison. And what's the result? The result is what God planned. That there are people who are saved. And the result is still happening. Not only is it happening with the people who pass on. It's happening with us who live. Will we continue to walk with Christ all the way to the end? Will we hold on to the most important gift that has ever been offered to us? A substitution on our behalf that staggers imagination, and you know what? We'll never have to understand it fully because we'll never be forsaken. So hold on to what you have. Understand what you have. And look at the price of what it cost and praise God because neither the Father nor the Son nor the Holy Spirit is willing to abandon us. In Jesus' name, amen.